This is Chthonia, the world of the dark feminine. Hello and welcome to Chthonia, the podcast dealing with the dark feminine. I'm your host, Breach Burke, and as we start off 2022, uh, the first episode that I wanted to record was based on a story that I heard. Um, it's not it's not it's not a new story to me. It's one that I actually heard uh, years ago, or had read years ago, but was recently brought to my mind again. Um, when I was at uh, Dr. Martin Shaw's 50th birthday in Devon, he had he told a number of stories at his uh, birthday, sort of storytelling birthday celebration um, down in uh, Dartington. And one of the stories that he told was the story of what he referred to as the story of Lady Ragnell. Now, in more in the in the way that this uh, character is represented in literature, usually is as Dame Ragnell. Um, but you know the, the idea is the same, and there's probably some version that refers to her as Lady as well. But this one is, and and it's one of those Arthurian legends uh, that is uh, that it follows a certain kind of folktale motif. Usually, it's one known as the motif of the loathly lady, and it's it's an interesting one. And when he had mentioned it, I thought, you know, this is a really good one for uh, for the podcast. So. What I'm going to do is, uh, the way that I want to talk about this is I want to talk about Dame Ragnell or those that are similar to her. Uh, I'm going to pick two two main specific stories. The first is a 15th century poem called uh, The Wedding of Sir Gawain and Dame Ragnell. Okay, so that's the the first um, piece that I want to, first story that I want to tell connected with Dame Ragnell. The second one is an earlier one that comes from Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and it is from The Wife of Bath's Tale, which, interesting, I'm remembering that I actually did a study of that tale when I was in, um, when I was at school at University of Reading, and I did, I took an uh, Old English uh, Chaucer course, and that was one of the um, tales that my particular group had been working on, um, and it's just been a long time since I've read it, and I just said, oh yeah, I'd Maybe that, that I'm not sure if that's the first place that I saw it. I don't feel like that's the first place that I read this story, but it's the you know, but it's but it's a motif that's been around. When you wait, when I tell you what the story is about, and you may already be familiar with the story, um, it it's rather surprising to me that uh, maybe maybe surprising or not, maybe maybe I shouldn't be surprised, but given um, the way that. The, the feminine has been perceived, and certainly the way women have been perceived in their role um, throughout the ages, at least in uh, European history. It's it's fascinating to me that these stories were written, um, you know, 15th century and perhaps earlier uh, about, about women. And the main question that appears in this particular story of what is it that women want, okay, so this is a uh, this is a good this is a good starter tale here. Okay, so without further ado, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read from those two texts, and then I want to talk about the two main motifs, that of the loathly lady, and also I'm going to talk a little bit about the idea of the Celtic sovereignty goddess, which has a connection here. Um, whether I, I don't know that I'd go as far as to say that this is you know another extension of a Celtic sovereignty tale necessarily. But nonetheless, there is there is definitely um, in the older Arthurian legends. There's definitely this idea of this uh, sovereignty goddess that does appear here. So that is what I am going to that that that's going to be the the agenda, as you would for this particular episode. Okay, so the wedding of Sir Gawain and Dame Ragnell. Okay, so uh, in this particular story, I'm going to read this uh, this plot summary here. Um, and yes, I, I rather than read the original story, which is written in um, that Middle English dialect that would be somewhat hard to understand. So I think the summary is good enough. Um, and this one, I, I've just taken it straight from Wikipedia because it's accurate. Um, the story begins when mystical knight Sir Gromer, oh, Sir Gromer Summerjur, okay, which some people in tra- translate as having to do with the summer man or summer day, 
Um, there is scholarship that argues against that, but I'm not going to get sidetracked into that. Uh, challenges King Arthur to discover what women desire the most or face dire consequences. Uh, this encounter takes place following the stalking of a deer by the king in Inglewood Forest, a setting that in other Middle English Arthurian poems, um, such as The Adventures of Arthur and Sir Gawain and the Carl of Carlisle, is a haunted forest and a place where the other world is near at hand. The king, on his own instructions, becomes separated from the rest of his hunting party, follows the deer, kills it, and then is surprised by the arrival of an armed knight, Sir Gromer Samajur, whose lands this knight claims have been seized from him by Sir Gawain. King Arthur is alone and unarmed, and Sir Gromer's arrival poses a real threat to him. Although, if he's unarmed, how is he killing a deer? But anyway. Um, so, Sir Gromer tells the king that he must return in exactly one year's time, alone and dressed as he is now, and give him the answer to the question he will ask. If the king fails to give a satisfactory answer, Sir Gromer will cut off his head. The question is this. What is it that women most desire? Now, um, just a, re a side note about Sir Gromer Summer Jour, um, or Jour, if, it's a ref if it is a reference to day. Um, that, you know, there, there, some of the scholarship suggests, uh, I, was, I was just reading a scholarly article that suggested he was a, or really just an ordinary human being. And I'm thinking, uh, not, not if, not if he's challenging King Arthur, not if he can challenge King Arthur and if King Arthur armed or unarmed is, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, afraid of this man. And if you're going to issue the kind of challenge that makes you return in a year, um, it's probably, probably not with a human being. Uh, as as is follows the uh, pattern of these tales, um, so anyway, uh, yeah, I, I and I believe Martin Shaw had referred to uh, Sir Gromer Summerjur as a as a giant of some kind. So uh, there definitely seems to be an earthly, unearthly um, aspect to this knight. Okay, going on, King Arthur returns to Carlisle with his knights, and it is not long before Sir Gawain pries from his uncle the reason for his sudden melancholy. King Arthur explains to his nephew what happened to him in the forest, and Sir Gawain, optimistically upbeat, suggests they both ride about the country collecting answers to this tricky question. <clears throat> so they both do this, riding separately about the kingdom and writing down the answers they receive. When they return, they compare notes. Sir Gawain is still willing, but King Arthur senses the hopelessness of it all and decides to go once more into Inglewood Forest to look for inspiration. In the forest, he encounters an ugly hag on a fine late horse, a loathly lady, who claims to know the king's problem and offers to give him the answer to this question that will save his life, on one condition, that she is allowed to marry Sir Gawain. The king returns to Carlisle and reluctantly confronts Sir Gawain with his dilemma, for he is sure that his nephew will be willing to sacrifice him in order to save him. Gawain selflessly consents in order to save his uncle. Soon King Arthur rides alone into the forest to fulfill his promise to Sir Gromer Summerjour and quickly meets with Dame Ragnell, who is in fact Sir Gromer's sister, and who reminds King Arthur of the hopelessness of his task. The king has ridden but a while, little more than the space of a mile, or, or he met Dame Ragnell. Ah, Sir King, you are now welcome here. I want you ride to bear your answer, that will avail you no delay. King Arthur tells her that Sir Gawain accepts her terms, and she reveals to him that what women desire the most is sovereignty, the ability to make their own decisions. With this answer, King Arthur wins Gromer's challenge, and much to his despair, the wedding of Gawain and Ragnall goes ahead as planned. Later, the newlyweds retire to their bedroom. After brief hesitation, Gawain assents to treat his new bride as if she were, as he would if she were desirable, and go to bed with her as a dutiful husband is expected to do. However, when he looks up, he is astonished to see not an ugly hag, but the most beautiful woman he has ever seen standing before him. Ragnell explains that she had been under a spell to look like a hag until a good knight married her. Now her looks will be restored, but only half the day. She gives him a choice. Would he rather have her beautiful at night when they are together or during the day when they are with others? Instead, he puts the riddle's answer to good practical use by giving her the sovereignty to make the choice herself. This answer lifts the curse for good, and Ragnell's beauty returns permanently. The couple live happily, and the court is overjoyed when they hear Ragnell's story. Sadly, Ragnell lives for only five more years, after which Gawain mourns her the rest of his life. 
Um, according to the poem, Ragnell bore Gawain, his son, Gingalain, who is the hero of his own romance, and whose arrival at King Arthur's court and subsequent adventures are related, possibly by Thomas Chester in the Middle English version of the story The Fair Unknown. Okay. Um, and again, the, the authorship of this particular poem is not entirely clear. Some think uh, Sir Thomas Mallory, who wrote many of down many of the Arthurian tales, may have written it himself, or it may have just been one of his sources. Um, so we don't, uh, so yeah, so we have this story and as we see, okay, so what's the motif? You have this old hag who's in the woods. Now she's knowledgeable. She knows what it is that women want. And as we can see, she's not the most, um, not the most beautiful of women. You know, she's not out there desirable. She doesn't have that, um, she doesn't apparently at least have that, uh, sexual, um, attraction that men would have, uh, to, to her. And you, and as we have talked about in this podcast before, you have the motif of this old crone. And of course the old crone is, is, tends to be magical in her own way and is a bearer of great wisdom. So what we end up having here is, you know, so you have this, and so she insists she's going to marry Gawain, who is one of the handsomest young knights. Um, now they talk about it being at the court of Carlisle, we tend to think of King Arthur as being at Camelot. Um, but it's, um, you know, but it, but nonetheless, so you have this idea of basically of the ugly old woman marrying the handsome uh, young man. And of course, um, according to the motif, she doesn't turn out to be an ugly lady at all. She's actually quite beautiful. So um, a bit to unpack there. But let's move over to the wife of Bath for a moment. Okay, now the wife of Bath is um, one of the, um, it's part of this uh, um, longer series, you know, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, uh, of, of different pilgrims who are on their way to Canterbury uh, Cathedral, and as they, um, and as they are traveling together uh, to this spot, they have, um, you know, they, they are all, you know, they, they take turns on, you know, on, you know, as they go along telling stories, and the wife of Bath, of course, is not, you know, when we think about um, the medieval period, um, wife of Bath's tale is, um, me, I'm just trying to remember the, uh, the year of this. Um, let's see. Probably, yeah, so we're probably talking late 1300s is about when this was, you know, probably written. Um, I, it's funny, I can't, I can't quite remember, but I know it was definitely earlier than the other one. So I want to say that this is, this is 14th century. Um, you know, 14th century to maybe early 15th century. Um, and so you have the, um, there's, there's two parts to her tale. There's the Wife of Bath's prologue, which is actually twice as long as her actual story. And then of course, um, but it does show the importance of the prologue to the significance of the tale. So again, I'm going to look at the synopsis of this because um, Chaucer's uh, it is written, like I said, it's written in the in the Old English style, and that might not be understandable to a lot of people. Um, but nonetheless, I will read in, uh, in the Old English, the, um, the Old to Middle English. I want to say that this is Old English. Um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, I remember, was more Middle English. But in any case, um, so wife of Bath has been married multiple times. And she makes an argument in her prologue about men, about holy men who have had multiple wives. She said, um, I would well Abraham was an unholy man, and Jacob eke as for forth I can. And each of them had wives more than two, and many another holy man also. When saw ye ever in any manner age that had God defended marriage by express word? I pray you tell it me. Or where commanded he virginity? Okay. And which essentially translates to, I know well that Abraham was a holy man and Jacob as well. As far as I know, and each of them had more than two wives. And many other holy men did as well. When you have seen that, when have you seen that in any time, great God forbade marriage explicitly? Tell me, I pray you, or where did he order people to remain virgins? Okay. Um, so, you know, if, if nothing else, she's certainly addressing the double standard here. 
about um, about marriage, particularly when you know if men marry more than once, and then you know the way that people look at win- uh, women. I, I I found myself as I was reading through these stories, thinking back to Dumavati in um, the Hindu among the Hindu matrikas, or really no Mahavidyas. She's not a matrika. She's among the Mahavidyas, and. Um, she is, you know, and she is the embodiment of widowhood, you know, and, and the dangerousness of widowhood. Because if a w- widow is still young enough and attractive, she can, um, you know, ensnare other young men. But otherwise, she, um, you know, she tends to represent, she's a woman who is independent. And therefore, in some ways, there's a danger to that. And so now we're seeing that similar element here um, in the way that, there is a disapproval of women who, when they lose their husbands, who marry again, or who, um, you know, um, you know, and and she's trying to. It mentions here that uh, I'm just quoting from. This is actually again. I'm just taking a summary from Wikipedia rather than trying to dig the books out. She says through this quote, she addresses why society should not look down on her or any other woman who has wed multiple men throughout their life. The tale confronts the double standard and social belief in the inherent inferiority of women and attempts to establish a defense of secular women's sovereignty that opposes the conventions available to her. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, if women are, women are often seen with respect to their husbands. If you walk in any graveyard, um, you know, any ancient, any old graveyard, you will see a man's tombstone and then buried, you know, and, and his wife, so and so, you know, whatever her name is. Um, but she's not known by her own name or necessarily even by her, you know, not always even with her own original surname. It's always, you know, wife of. So women are always defined in these roles in their in terms of their relationship to the man who is supposed to be their husband. Or if not their husband, their father. Okay. So there so as so we see, even as far back here in as this um in this period of time. And this is, this is quite a long time ago. We're talking 800 years ago, and, and I would imagine that this is not an idea that, that, that started and finished here. But the idea of women having sovereignty, women um, being known in their own right, and not just being known in their own right, but making their own decisions. Okay, so let's do the tale of the, um, the wife of Bath. Um, so I'm going to give you the synopsis of the tale right here. And it will sound very familiar. There was a knight in King Arthur's time who raped a fair young maiden. King Arthur issues a decree that the knight must be brought to justice. When the knight is captured, he is condemned to death, but Queen Guinevere intercedes on his behalf and asks the king to allow her to pass judgment on him. The queen tells the knight he will be spared his life if he can discover for her what it is that women most desire, and allots him a year and a day in which to roam wherever he pleases and return with an answer. Everywhere the knight goes, he explains his predicament to the women he meets and asks their opinion, but, in quotes, no two of these he questioned answered the same. The answers range from fame and riches to play or clothes or sexual pleasure or flattery or freedom. When at last the time comes for him to return to the court, he still lacks the answer he so desperately needs. Outside a castle in the woods, he sees 24 maidens dancing and singing, but when he approaches, they disappear as if by magic, and all that's left is an old woman. The knight explains the problem to the old woman, who is wise and may know the answer, and she forces him to promise to grant any favor she might ask of him in return. With no options left, the knight agrees. Arriving at the court, he gives the answer that women most desire sovereignty over their husbands, which is unanimously agreed to be true by the women of the court, who accordingly free the knight. The old woman then explains to the court that she the deal she has struck with the knight, and publicly requests his hand in marriage. Although aghast, he realizes he has no other choice and eventually agrees. On their wedding night, the old woman is upset that he is repulsed by her in bed. She reminds him that her looks can be an asset. She will be a virtuous wife to him because no other men would desire her. She asks him which one he would prefer, a wife who is true and loyal, or a beautiful young woman who may not be faithful. The knight responds by saying that the choice is hers. Happy that she now has the ultimate power, having taken to heart the lesson of sovereignty and relinquished control, rather than choosing for her, she promises him both beauty and fidelity. The knight turns to look at the old woman again, but now finds a young and lovely woman. The old woman makes what women want most, and the answer she gives, uh, true to him, sovereignty. Okay, so now we have this we have this term sovereignty, and now it might be clear why 
we want to link this to the, the idea of the sovereignty goddess. Because um, sovereignty has more than one meaning. Um, I mean, they're, they're related, but, but there's more than one. Sovereignty is a term that you will see in, um, you know, legal proceedings, um, le- you know, and, and policy about land ownership, because sovereignty literally has to do with ownership. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, when, you know, who's the sovereign over a particular piece of land. And sovereign, of course, is a word, the word reign, R-E-I-G-N, is within the word sovereign. So it's a matter of who is ruling over or who is, who has control of this particular piece of property. And it's also worth noting that the word reign, um, R-E-I-G-N, which, which relates to rulers and royalty, um, it specifically relates to the word rule. Um, and when we think about a ruler, not just in terms of being a king, but if we think of the actual object that we use along the ground to measure, okay, so um, it's been point. you know, there was a um, philosophical work I read a number of years ago um, on Europe, I think it was, and the the author, whose name is escaping me at the moment, uh, had mentioned the the, the um, linguistic connection between all these words. You know, the, the word rex and and um, regulate and ruler and and ideas like reigning and so you know that that um, this idea of measuring is connected with the idea of control. Okay, this is the way that you control something. This is the way that you measure it out. And so, in in theory, in this way of thinking, if the king is the in charge of the land is the one who makes the laws um then the the king is the one who sets the ruler okay like you know they who actually measures out what what the boundary is how far you can go okay so sovereignty has to do with um you know this idea of property so for a woman to have her own sovereignty basically means that she doesn't want to be considered somebody else's property Okay, which nowadays we say, well, yeah, of course. But again, if we go back to this, what we were saying about, you know, the the woman, it's frequently now why a lot of women don't necessarily want to take their husband's last name, for example. You know, I don't want to just be known as Mrs. So-and-so. I have I have my own name. I have my own background. Okay. And I don't necessarily want to be subsumed into yours. Um, and that's, that, that is definitely an element of what we'll call patriarchal culture. Um, and I'm saying that with respect to matriarchal cultures where this, um, this does not happen, where the husband moves into the woman's house. There are some societies left where this does occur. Uh, there are elements of matriarchy in Kerala, India, for example. There are elements of matriarchy, um, in, among some of the North, uh, Native American tribes. Um, and then there are certain... Um, you know, you know, South Pacific. There are certain um, cultures that still have it where the the woman is the is the one in charge rather than the man. But certainly, what we see in societies where the society is male dominated, and this is an example of male domination. You know, the idea of when you get married, you take your husband's name. You know, there's the idea that the woman is now identity is now subsumed into that of the husband. And um, and while this isn't necessarily an invective against marriage. It is an invective against the idea that a woman now is nothing more than the property of or an extension of her spouse. So, um, so, and this this seems to connect back to this theme of the idea of the land goddess, the the, the Celtic idea of the land goddess, the one that you would marry, the 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 king would be married, you know, in some kind of ceremony, um, probably, you know, you know, the the literal metaphorical line. I mean, I you know. Who knows, right? But nonetheless, the idea is um, that that when they pledge allegiance to certain goddesses or they, quote-unquote, marry themselves or take oaths to the goddess of a land, um, it's very very similar in nature because nature is, um, a lot of times the, the, the feminine is represented by nature because nature can be extremely beautiful and it can also be extremely wild and extremely scary. Um... And, you know, we, you know, and, and it's so, you know, so there's this, there's, so you definitely see this in the, in the spectrum of, uh, of females, in the spectrum of women, of womanhood. There are, you know, a woman is not a woman is not a woman. There's, there's different, there's different phases to a woman's life. There's different aspects to her character. You know, there's the, there's the young girl, there's the, um, sexually mature woman who may or may not become a mother. 
I mean, certainly in this system, it would be assumed that the woman would become a mother. There is the childless woman, the woman who chooses to remain. The old word used to be spinster, okay? Um, you know, uh, who chose not to have children because it was also an assumption in a society where, you know, you didn't have sex until you were married that, um, you know, not having sex also meant be remaining a perpetual virgin. And of course, the term virgin hasn't always meant the same thing over time. Virgin is, uh, in, you know, in, in ancient Greece, for example, virgin is simply a term for an unmarried woman. And, and ancient Greece is not the only place. That's just, the, the first thing I think of is Aphrodite, for example, is described as a virgin. And we know, we certainly know that that isn't true in a sexual sense. But, in, in terms of uh, until she was married to Hephaestus, she was considered to be a, a quote-unquote virgin. Um, then, there were, then there were goddesses who did shun sex, like Artemis and Athena. Um, but, and that is another aspect of womanhood. Women, women can have this, this other aspect to them, but it often seems to always be defined in relationship to men or what they're doing with men. And women want to be defined on their own terms. And... Um, when you are dealing with a, a land goddess, okay, and, and this is why I think this that motif, even though some scholars say, hey, don't 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 use this motif for every story that contains this kind of a thing, um, you know, it's uh, it, nonetheless, nonetheless, it it does make sense here as far as I'm concerned, because the woman in question here is um. You know, she does seem to be a representation of the land. She comes from a forest that's the other world. You know, they, her and um, her brother live in this this place that is liminal, that is on the edge, um, and that, that that seems to almost have a fairy like quality to it, um, and very very elemental. It's it's the way we get out of what we call what we think of as the quote unquote civilized world and moving into wilder territory. Um, so. She is, um, so in this case, yeah, you could, you could potentially see the motif there of this, um, of this, uh, Dame Ragnell actually being the land goddess or, or a goddess of sovereignty. And so when Gawain marries her, and it's interesting that Gawain is supposedly, um, that the knight, that the, uh, original knight, Sir Gomer, is, ori his original complaint is that Gawain has stolen his lands, now, that's not the case in The Wife of Bath's Tale. The Wife of Bath's Tale, we see a rape that goes on, okay? Which, again, is another, in a way, um, if, if you take that idea of women as not having their own sovereignty, it, it's almost a similar kind of a thing. The rape is, of course, a, a, a violation, um, a, a treating of a woman as, you know, you know, being able to violate the boundaries of that woman or the rules of that woman. If Gawain is taking lands that belong to Sir Gomer, again, this is like a way of stealing away or, um, you know, you know, violating the boundaries that um, are set uh, for this particular, you know, d d you know, for this particular land. So in a way, you're, you know, you're talking in some way about the same thing. Rape is another term, ancient term that's used that doesn't always mean what it implies. Although this, in this case, I think it is literally referring to um, the rape of a young woman. So... Uh, so these things, you know, it's it's the idea, and, and of course the reason I think that this, the knight who is unnamed here in The Wife of Bath's Tale, uh, the reason that he is able to, um, you know, once he understands, the, the idea is that Guinevere lets him off once he has understands the idea that women are, uh, we, we, you know, women are their own people. You, you can't just, you can't just violate the boundaries of woman. Um, and this is why I think the hag appears. She appears in that form of uh of a land goddess who is there to remind you know that you know you're, you're you know um you know you need to you need to respect the earth you know you you come out of that you are um you are you are separate you know you are not you know th th there's the old as i've mentioned the old biblical motif of you know um man in quotes meaning humans are set over the earth or man in particular is set over the creatures of the earth and this is a reminder here that, no, you're not. <laughs> I mean, you know, there, there may be, you know, yes, there is a certain amount of taming, civilizing, controlling, but at the root of it, um, you know, you're, you're not really more potent than these, um, you know, or more powerful than these female figures. Um, but when the women are treated with respect, 
and w- given their sovereignty, then they are beautiful women. So in other words, you, now you're really seeing um, all the gloriousness of that, that feminine aspect. Um, and you're not, it's not, not just the things that, um, you know, frighten you or repel you. Okay. Um, and it was interesting in Martin Shaw's version, he does talk about, um, lady, lady Ragnell, as he said, as being one, you know, devouring, you know, devouring animals and, you know, things in her path and stuff like that, you know, that she was, that she was in fact, some kind of a kind of grotesque devouring figure. Um, whether that's always the that that whether that's the inflection in this story or not, but that was the that was the way he had told it, and um, you know, so again, there's that idea of the this 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 scary devouring feminine, this hag figure who is not um, who does who doesn't meet the standards of what you know this particular society wants from women. They want women who are beautiful and who are sexually desirable women who are obedient, women who take on their role, women who become mothers. They have to, um, and it's not that women can't do these things or that women may not even want to do these things for themselves, but the idea that it would be imposed upon them um, is, is the, you know, and that decisions are made for them since they are obviously somehow considered to be, you know, even you even, even saw this motif in, you know, you know, the Iliad, for example. Women are regarded as property. Okay. And women don't want to be regarded as property. Um, now, um, on the motif of the loathly lady, which is the other thing I had wanted to discuss, um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm reading a thing on this. It says, you know, it's com- most commonly used in medieval literature, most famously in the wife of Bath's tale. Um, and she undergoes a transformation upon being approached by a man in spite of her unattractiveness, becoming extremely desirable. Okay. Um, and there, they mentioned there's, um, there's a few other discussions in, um, um, the, uh, Fenian cycle of Irish mythology. Um, <clears throat> I want to say this is pronounced Dermud Aduvne, but, um, uh, this is a, uh, a story of, of him where he actually also encounters a loathly lady who they say brazenly enters the Fianna Lodge. See, that's the other thing about her too. She's not afraid to approach. She's not submissive. She's uh, sort of very assertively tells you what it is that she wants. And, um, and this just, I'm not going to read this whole story, but they said one freezing winter's night, the loathly lady enters the lodge where the warriors had just gone to bed after a hunting expedition. Drenched to the bone, her sodden hair was snarled and knotted. Desperate for warmth and shelter, she knelt beside each warrior and demanded a blanket beginning with their leader, Finn. Despite her rants and temper tantrums, the tired men only rolled over and ignored her in the hope she would leave. Only young Dermud, whose bed was nearest the fireplace, took pity on the wretched woman, giving her his bed and blanket. The loathly lady noticed Dermud's love spot and said that she had wandered in the world alone for seven years. Dermud reassured her and told her she could sleep all night and that he would protect her. Towards dawn, he became aware that she had become a beautiful young woman. And so this story proceeds a little differently because they, um, you know, so he ends up with this house overlooking the sea, which is what he wanted. The woman comes and lives with him. She agrees and on the condition that he never mention how ugly she was the first night they met. And after three days together, he grows restless. She offers to watch his greyhounds and new pups while he went hunting. And she starts giving the greyhound pups away, and he gets very, very angry. And, he each, and, and several times he says to her, um, how could she repay him so meanly when he overlooked her ugliness on the first night that they met? So he keeps mentioning it, and then finally she leaves, and then his, his beloved greyhound dies. So then he has to, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, now, now he has to go in and find her. So there's, there's more to this story about now how he has to go and realizing his mistake to go um, recover the, the woman. Because that's another motif that we have, too, you know, is that when somebody tells you not to do something, this happens a lot, actually, in Irish mythology. It's happened with stories of the Morrigan as well. You know, I, you know the one thing I ask you, the woman asks you not to do is, is literally the one thing that you do. And um, so the the rewards of being connected to that to that goddess are now lost because you know <clears throat> you couldn't respect the one thing that was asked of you, um, and uh, you know and you know in the case of Maka, for example, in in, in the story um, of um, there's, there's another story in which she marries a you know a farmer who's lost his wife. She appears in his house and just like takes over as the wife, takes care of the kids, cleans the house, and it was like, oh okay, and she just says, um, you know, and and but he can tell she's from the other world because she can run very fast and she can do certain things, and he says to her, um, and she says, look, whatever you do, you can never mention to anyone 
you know, I'll stay here as long as you never mention these things to anyone. So, of course, he doesn't for a long time. But then when there's a big festival and the king has a new horse and he says this horse is faster than anything, he can't resist bragging that his wife could run faster than the horse. So, of course, because he's insulted the king, they drag her out and make her run the race, even though she's pregnant with twins and in labor. So she does race. She does run the race because otherwise he'll die. She beats the other, you know, the horse. But, um, you know, she gives birth to her twins and they and they die. And so she ends up cursing all the men of Ulster. So, you know, there's, there's this... Um, so you can see where this sovereignty motif comes in. Now, in the case of um, of Macha, she's not the she's not a loathly lady, but she's otherworldly, just as the loathly lady tends to be. And so this is where you might see this connection of the hag and the crone with things like witchcraft, for example. Um, you know, the idea of of the old crone is somehow being um, this old this magical being, or just by virtue of the fact that the hag is closer to death, being closer to the other world in that respect. So, um, so this, yeah, so this was, this is an interesting tale to, to start off with here, to start the year with. Um, I mean, I'm wonder, I, I think a lot about how these tales play out in our world today. And I just, just sort of, I want to end with an interesting thing that I'd heard. It's just a, it's really just a tidbit, but, um, it, it was a big New York Post article about it. But, um, it was, and it was mentioned, I was watching uh, the late show with Stephen Colbert. I was just watching the, um, one of the monologues and it was about how, um, men no, you know, uh, something about, um, since COVID men no longer looking for sex, which of course is not the slant of it. There was apparently a survey or a study done of people on dating sites, particularly match.com and things like that. And, um, one of the questions that came up was when men go online, you know, uh, how important is sex, you know, in, in terms of dating? What is the first thing, um, you know, what is it, you know, what is it they're looking for online? Are they looking for sex? Are they looking for, you know, you know, and surprisingly, they said that about, you know, that since COVID, about 80% of the men who responded said, no, nah, they were just looking for a woman that they could get to know and sex wasn't the primary thing. Um, now, mind you, this is just one study. This is, you know, by no way statistically significant sample. Um, but by the same token, it, it's, it, it, I feel like it shows there, that an interesting shifting in attitude. Not that sex and the importance of sex hasn't gone away. It's not that people have suddenly become non-sexual beings. But a situation of isolation where, you know, people, because of a pandemic, couldn't go out and have sex with people they didn't know very well. Um, you know, unless that person was already in their own house. Uh, and even then, you know, you, you live in that, you, you stay under the same roof with one person long enough, you're, you're sick of them. So, um, you know, I mean, well, maybe that's going too far, but at the very least you want some space from each other. So, you know, so the idea of, you know, all the sex going on, you know, tends to be, you know, it, it tends to become in that kind of environment. It's weird how it's become a more secondary thing. When at least for, for men, a lot of time in particular, it was more of a primary thing. Um, it, you know, you know, there was always the old argument about how men, quote unquote, have needs to fulfill, and um, and so often, sometimes, and a lot of times, that happening at the expense of the woman, in the sense of the woman is really just more of an object for sex and not an actual person. Um, so that gets back to a lot of the discussion here, and, and it's amazing to me also how many women I've seen, you know, who you know, who haven't, haven't been engaging in sex or haven't been looking for relationships. But there does seem to be a thing now more about, well, no, I want to get to know you and let's, let's become friends and get to know each other and then see about the other part of it, uh, which I find, you know, which I find really interesting. Um, so what, what it's ultimately says about, because I think also the, this whole question of sovereignty also goes back to this, what they call the subject object thing. You know, are you being objectified or are you a subject? Are you a, an individual in your own right, you know, who is a person with their own wants, needs, you know, whatever. And that, and that may sound like a crazy, you know, almost, it may sound like, you know, I'm, I'm being, you know, ridiculously obvious there, but, um, but a lot of times that doesn't happen. Um, there, there is, a there is the idea of the man who uh, pretends to be interested in what a woman's interested in just so he can get something. And then after that, it's just, yeah, I don't care anymore. Um, but I don't know. I often wonder if if seeing things like that, you know, it's small. It's one survey. It doesn't, you know, it's not demonstrative of all of man, you know, mankind, literally. But um, 
you know, that and, um, you know, and, and the different ways that we're now construing gender, not just between men and women, but people who you know, are non-binary or identified differently. Um, I don't know. It's, it's interesting to see what kind of long-term impact that's going to have on the way that people relate to each other and these questions of sovereignty. So with that, I'm going to uh, end this podcast. I want to thank you very much for listening. I want to thank all my supporters on Patreon. Um, Patreon subscribers do get an extra podcast or extra material every month um, at the $5 level and above. So if you would like to join that group, um, please uh, go to patreon.com slash chthonia. Um, and that's also a group where I'm, I'm looking to see if there's an interest to, um, start some, some discussions or some live streams, uh, and other things. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, I would like to see more people. I have a lot of people on there now who, you know, I, and I completely understand it. I belong to a couple other Patreons and when they start offering certain things, I'm like, gee, I'd love to do that, but I'm extremely busy. Um, so it's, you know, so if there are people who are legitimately interested in that, um, you know, you, you can definitely uh, reach me there. Uh, please check out all my work on Chthonia.net. Chthonia.net is now entirely focused on this podcast, publications, and on my uh, research on areas related to the dark, you know, dark feminine and, and certainly related subjects. So, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping to expand um, a lot of what's offered in this podcast. Um, another thing that I've started offering um, this past fall and that I'm going to expand on is a school, uh, Scholars of the Borderland, which you can also check out on Chthonia.net. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at all of these things. Follow me on social media, Chthonia on YouTube, Chthonia Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. Two words on Facebook, one word on, in, on Instagram. Uh, thanks again for listening, and until next time. Mm-hmm.